We begin the day with the challenge from China and a partnership that could possibly contain it. U.S. President Joe Biden is hosting Japan's Prime Minister Fumio Kishida for talks in Washington with defense ties top of the agenda. Closer cooperation between former foes to head off a new threat from Beijing. Now, the clock is ticking to get things done and to make it stick. China is increasingly flexing its muscles in the disputed South China Sea and elections are looming in the United States, which could see Donald Trump returning to the White House. Biden called the partnership between Washington and Tokyo today, quote, unbreakable. The two leaders announced a new enhanced military partnership, and that means greater integration of their militaries and closer cooperation on arms production. Now, on Thursday, Biden and Kashida will be joined by the president of the Philippines, Ferdinand Marcos Jr. The Philippines have had a number of maritime run-ins with the Chinese as Beijing attempts to assert control over the South China Sea. Our East Asia correspondent, James Chater, takes a look now at what's at stake. In the South China Sea this week, a show of force from the U.S. and its Indo-Pacific allies. The U.S., Japan and the Philippines alongside Australia in their first ever joint naval exercises, designed to uphold freedom of navigation in the contested waters. The drills, a prelude to another first, Thursday's historic summit between the leaders of the U.S., Japan and the Philippines, two countries with which Washington has mutual defense treaties. Bringing these nations together, what some Japanese officials call the most complex security environment since World War II, including a more belligerent North Korea, but mainly a more assertive China under President Xi Jinping. Both Manila and Tokyo have maritime disputes with Beijing. Friction in the South China Sea especially, where China has recently fired water cannons at Philippine vessels, has raised fears the US could be drawn into direct conflict with Beijing. But there are even deeper concerns over the fate of Taiwan, the self-ruled island which China claims is its own and has vowed to take by force if necessary. If Beijing were to take Taiwan, it would radically shift Asia's balance of power in favor of China. And for Japan and the Philippines, which rely on smooth trade flows through the Taiwan Straits, it would have national security implications too. You only have to look at a map to understand why. Mavulis Island, the northernmost point of the Philippines, is just 140 kilometers from Taiwan's mainland. The nearest Japanese island, Yonaguni, is even closer, around 110 kilometers away. Japan recently deployed new military units there. Both are much closer to Taipei than either Manila or Tokyo. Increasingly, Japan and the Philippines are working together in talks now for a deal that would allow their militaries to be stationed on each other's territory. Analysts say that, as well as Thursday's summit, are all part of U.S. efforts to bring their allies in the region closer together. The more you have crisscrossing lines you have over the region, uh, the more um, com complex the strategic decision for Xi Jinping and China would be um, it, should it decide to, uh, to escalate uh, tensions, for example, over Taiwan. Despite active conflicts in Europe and the Middle East, Washington maintains Asia is its long-term foreign policy focus. The summit between the U.S. and two of its most important regional allies, the latest sign of the shifting currents in the Indo-Pacific's security picture. All right, I want to go now to our correspondent, Janelle Dumoulin. She's following the biden kashida meeting at the White House today. Janelle, good to see you. So how do the U.S. and Japan intend to strengthen their alliance? Yes, well, you can really see the White House rolling out uh, the red carpet uh, for Fumio Kishida today. Worth noting, he is only the fifth leader to get a state dinner from the Biden administration, uh, complete with musical entertainment from Paul Simon. Don't know if you're a fan, Brent. Mm -hmm. But in any case, this is all to show that uh, the U.S.-Japan alliance is at the heart of the U.S.'s um, Indo-Pacific strategy. Now, today they're expected to announce upgrades to their security relationship, including changes to the U.S. command in Japan that would allow the U.S. to work more closely with the Japanese military. They're also expected to announce a military industrial council that would allow the two countries to evaluate where they can co-produce defense weapons, along with a host of other economic, security, uh, space, and artificial intelligence 
intelligence agreements, all to show that it is important to them to elevate this relationship and take enduring steps uh, in order to prove its durability in the face of uh, increased Chinese aggression and uh, also in order to future-proof it depending on who ends up in power in Tokyo mm. or in Washington. Janelle, the eyes of the world are currently on the wars in Gaza and Ukraine. So why is the United States so focused on China and this perceived threat in the Indo-Pacific region now? As we heard in that report there, it is China that is considered the systematic rival to the U.S. And there really is an argument to be made that because the U.S. is enmeshed in these conflicts in Gaza and Ukraine, that there is even a greater argument for Washington to be able to develop its alliances in the, in the Indo-Pacific should anything happen there, such as uh, perhaps a, a Chinese attack on Taiwan, or much more likely uh, the escalation of tensions in the disputed areas of the South China Sea. Now there's this phrase that you often hear here in Washington, and that's uh, to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time, meaning Washington's ability to serve various alliances, even perhaps in the face of concurrent crises. And you can argue that alliances in uh, the Indo-Pacific, strong alliances, and also the fact that these allies also have strong relationships with each other, would help Washington achieve that goal of being able to walk and chew gum at the same time. Mm. And, you know, it can also perhaps even go beyond the region. Worth noting here that Japan is actually Ukraine's strongest uh, partner in the Indo-Pacific, showing that Japan and the U.S. really are like-minded countries, and their alliance is especially important when it comes to preserving the rules-based order, not mm. just in the Indo-Pacific, but beyond. Janelle Dumoulin with the latest in Washington. Janelle, as always, thank you. For more, I'm joined now by Kelly Grieco. She's a senior fellow at the Stimson Center in Washington, among other things. Her work looks at U.S. security policy in the Indo-Pacific. Ms. Grieco, it's good to have you with us. Um, President Biden today, he was effusive in his praise of Japan and the strength of the alliance. Let me get your take. Is it as strong as he says it is? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. It's been an exciting day in Washington. There are lots of uh, U.S. and Japanese flags all over the city. Uh, to get to your question, I think, you know, it's actually a more complicated uh, you know, question than it might seem, because at a political and strategic level, the alliance is actually quite close, and there's a close alignment in terms of um, their view of the region and the China threat. But when you sort of um, look under the hood, one of the things you realize is that the alliance really lacks a lot of the institutional mechanisms like what exists in NATO in order to actually facilitate cooperation at an operational level if they were ever to have to uh, fight together side by side. The U.S. has basically it's played the role of a protector of Japan since the, um, the end of the Second World War. Considering that, I want to quote something that you wrote. You co-authored a recent article about the alliance between the U.S. and Japan, and you write, for the past 70 years, the alliance has operated with two separate command structures, the United States and Japan, each retaining their independent chains of command. But you go on to say that in a conflict with China, this setup may no longer be fit for purpose. It could even be a disaster. Why do you think that? Yeah, so I've spent decades now studying uh, military alliances and coalitions when they actually go and have to fight wars together. And one of the things that I have routinely found was that the single most important thing was actually having a unified command structure, meaning that there was a way for there to be a single overall supreme commander in charge of all allied forces to be able to help with planning and to coordinate that effort. It's hard to believe, um, given how long standing this alliance is mm -hmm. and given the closeness of the relationship, but that kind of structure does not exist in the U.S.-Japan alliance, um, in part because of Japan being a self-defense force and the United States being a, um, a, a military. There's, that's an important distinction. But also because when the alliance was founded, really we thought of Japan more as a staging ground 
for conducting operations elsewhere in the region. Mm -hmm. But that's really changed today where Japan really, really now is on the front lines um, with competition with China and would really be an important um, player if we actually, in, in terms of deterring China, and if certainly if we had to um, try to defend Japan or somewhere else in the region. And do you think, j j should Japan have, um, you know, I guess um, a little bit of apprehension about what the United States would do if there were to be a military conflict with China based on history? And I'm thinking about the 9-11 attacks in the United States. Shortly thereafter, NATO invoked Article 5, offering military help to the U.S. And the response from George W. Bush at the time was thanks, but no thanks. We're going to do this ourselves. Is there a fear, do you think, in, in the Indo-Pacific region that the U.S. would do that again if there were a China attack? Yes, I mean, I think this is always an dynamic that exists within alliances that, you know, you're afraid, particularly if you are the smaller power in an alliance, that you'll be dragged into some kind of war by um, your larger, more powerful um, ally. Um, I don't think that is as much of an acute concern right now in, term, in terms of the relationship with um, United States and Japan, particularly on issues around Taiwan. Um, Japan is acutely concerned about that security issue. I also think there's a, quite a bit of recognition that if there were to be a conflict over Taiwan, that Japan would play certain kinds of roles. Mm -hmm. um, it would probably not be projecting power over the Taiwan Strait, for example, but would be able to take on more security responsibilities and defense roles um, in terms of protecting Japan's territory and seas. Here in Europe, uh, there's a lot of talk at NATO about the future proofing of the alliance moving forward. Let me ask you, how future proof are the agreements that Biden and Kushida are, are making right now, given the, the fact that the president of the United States this time next year might be a one and only Donald Trump? Yes, well, first, 70 deals um, have come out of this uh, meeting, which is extraordinary. Normally, a visit like this, you might see a dozen, maybe two dozen. Uh, so that in itself, I think, is quite noteworthy. But this idea of Trump-proofing um, alliances, I will just say that I'm a skeptic of this idea. Mm -hmm. uh, I think what we're really... what. It was, what we're trying to do, I think, is try to get as much done as possible in building up these alliances and strengthening them before a possible second Trump presidency on the hope that based on his behavior during his first presidency, he's not someone who cares as much about the details mm -hmm. and wouldn't necessarily have an interest in going about undoing things. So even if the, the alliances would not grow stronger under his presidency, um, there may at least be able to get to keep them at the level where they are. But of course, you know, hope is not a real strategy. Yeah. Yeah, let me ask you before we run out of time, the, the summit with um, the president of the Philippines tomorrow, how key is that alliance? Yes, I mean, I think when you look at, you know, the U.S.-Philippines alliance is very important. Um, of course, you look at the geography of the region and you can understand why the Philippines is very important to the United States and Japan, particularly in a Taiwan scenario. The one caution, though, that I would have is that the Philippines itself is really concerned about the South China Sea, not the Taiwan Strait. And so one thing that I think we need to be careful about is not thinking that they're leaning into the, these relationships, the Philippines, is a sign that they're signing up for potentially being involved in a Taiwan Strait scenario. I think that remains very unlikely. Okay. Kelly Grieco with the Stimson Center in Washington. Ms. Grieco, it's always good to see you. Excellent analysis. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you.